We've done a fair amount of driving in this car since buying it, but there are still some basic maintenance things that should probably be taken care of. So in this exciting new episode, we'll be tackling some of those mundane tasks. And the first general maintenance item on the list is changing out the transmission fluid and filter. The fluid looked just fine when I bought the car and it still looks fine now, but I don't know how long it's been since any of that has been changed, so it would be a good idea to give it an infusion of new fluid. We've already done enough 700R4 and 4L60E rebuilding on this channel, I would like to not have to do another. We'll start with the car rolled up on these little wooden ramps to help get the jack underneath. I should probably get a lower profile floor jack because this 4 ton tends to get into trouble with lower vehicles. It can be fit underneath this car, but you have to ram it underneath the air deflector and I probably shouldn't keep doing that. Anyway, with the parking brakes set, we'll raise the front of the car reasonably high off of the ground, get a pair of jack stands in place, and set it down. We've done this before on this channel, so we won't get too into the details, but changing the transmission fluid and filter on these vehicles is usually pretty straightforward. The only real trick is that there's no factory drain plug, so we're going to make a big mess dropping the transmission pan. So we have layered drain pans, cardboard, and paper towels at the ready. The transmission pan has 16 bolts around its perimeter, and luckily they're all pretty easy to get to on this car, so we'll go ahead and start loosening them. We're going in a loosely crisscross pattern and just removing the bolts outright as we go. Once we get to the last two or three, we'll loosen up the remaining bolts while leaving them partially installed and supporting the pan from underneath. Then usually the weight of the oil in the pan will be enough to break the seal and it will start to drain. We'll let it hang there and drip like that for a bit until the level of oil is below the top of the pan. With the majority of the dripping finished, we'll come back and hold the pan up against the transmission while removing the last remaining bolts. Once they're out of the way, we'll start tipping the pan forward to get it clear of the transmission cross member, and we'll try to catch the rest of the fluid pouring out of the pan as we tip it. In this case, the transmission filter came out with the pan. Normally you'll just reach up and wiggle it out of the seal to remove it. We'll leave the drain pans under the transmission because it will be dripping for all of eternity. While we wait for that, let's take a look at the transmission pan. The filter is still suctioned pretty well to the bottom, which must be why it stayed with it. We'll drain as much oil out of that as we can and set it aside to look at the bottom of the pan. This is usually where you'll see a lot of clutch material deposits on a worn high mileage transmission. There's only a little bit around the edges of the pan, but there is a decent pile of muck on top of the magnet. Considering that this is, to the best of my knowledge, the original unrebuilt transmission and the car has at least 200,000 miles on it, this isn't bad at all. We'll give the inside of the pan a decent cleaning and remove the old seal. At this point, I realized that the outside of the pan was simply too grimy to deal with by hand, so we went ahead and took it outside. We'll spray it down with some engine degreaser and let it soak in the sun for a while. And after giving it a second coating, we'll wipe off as much grime as we can with paper towels. It was still looking pretty questionable, so we gave it another coating of engine degreaser and then broke out the pressure washer. We gave it a thorough cleaning, but even after all of that, it still wasn't the nicest looking thing. Because of the strong demands from viewers, we will be painting this before reinstalling it. But before we get to that, I would really like for this transmission pan to have a drain plug. This channel has a bit of a sordid history with those. The first transmission drain plug we installed was on our 1988 S10 Blazer. This was just a hole drilled in the pan, a nut welded on the inside, and a regular bolt and aluminum crush washer used to seal it. Funnily enough, this one has never given me any trouble. Later, we repeated the same process on the Turbo 350 in the 78 Firebird, and that worked well for a while, but eventually it did develop an extremely slow leak. I'm pretty sure this is due to the uneven surface of the pan, and just using a flange bolt will probably correct this. There were quite a few comments on that video expressing concerns that the transmission wouldn't drain completely using this method. 
I didn't understand why that was really an issue, but when we installed the drain plug in our 2007 Silverado, we tried to correct for it anyway. We raised up the weld nut on the inside of the transmission pan just a little bit to let fluid empty out below it. But when a drain bolt was tightened down into that, it just deformed the pan surface and made a mess. So I went and welded a flat washer to the bottom of the pan, which helped, but still doesn't seal 100%. In the comments for that video, there were quite a few suggestions that we just use an aftermarket drain plug kit instead of going through the effort of welding a nut on the inside. So for our fourth try, that's what we're going to be using. This is a Dorman parts kit specifically designed to install a drain plug to a transmission that didn't come with one from the factory. It's kind of tall and the actual drain plug is pretty small, but I guess we'll just have to see how it works out. The drain plug itself only seals via this outside o-ring. The plug insert housing seals to the transmission pan via these two plastic washers. Just like the other methods we've used, installation of this kit starts with drilling a hole. The outer diameter of the housing is half an inch, so that's the size hole we need. We'll use the step drill to get there and carefully deburr the inside and outside edges. We'll use some Scotch-Brite to clean up the area where the plug is going to seal against the pan. Then we'll clean everything up and install the drain plug kit. We'll drop the housing into the pan and install the nylon washer and the nut on the other side. We'll add a bit of oil to the washers and the threads to make sure everything tightens smoothly. And then, with a wrench jammed on the nut inside of the transmission pan, we'll tighten it down from the outside with an impact. Then we'll come back and do a final tighten with a hand wrench to make sure that the nylon washer is fully squished. Everything is looking good, so I think we'll call that fully installed. Next, we'll prep it for a very quick coat of paint by just taping off the sealing surfaces. I doubt it would actually matter if we painted over these, but since they're still clean with the original factory coating, I think it's better to just leave them like that. Then we'll flip it over and install the actual plug into the drain plug assembly that we installed. We'll just tighten it by feel, enough so that the paint hopefully doesn't get into the threads. The o-ring is a bit squished, but should be fully compressed, I guess. Then we'll give everything one last rub down with brake clean, and give it a few thin coats of this cast aluminum paint just to even out the finish a bit. It doesn't have to look amazing, but it would be nice if it was at least all one color. While that's drying, we'll also use Bright Clean to spray out the bottom end of the transmission. This can help clean things out much more than just dropping the pan, but this transmission was pretty clean already, so it wasn't really that necessary. All we really had to do was wipe down the pan mating surfaces. While we're here, we also need to fish out the old filter seal. We'll do that by carefully prying with a flat blade screwdriver, making sure not to scratch the bore that it's sitting in. Once that's been removed, we're about ready to put things back together. The paint has dried nicely, and we have a new filter and pan gasket ready to go. For stamped steel pans, I prefer a rubberized cork gasket like this. For whatever reasons, I've never had an issue with one of these, and never had luck with anything else. For the filter, we have a basic model produced by Fram. We'll give the inside of the oil pan one last thorough cleaning to make sure that there's nothing left in there, and then lay out the pan gasket on top of it. The bolts aren't too crusty, so we'll just give them a quick wipe down and put them back into use. They're a reasonably tight fit through the gasket, so we were actually able to push all of them up into place, and the gasket will hold them there while we install the pan underneath the car. It's finally time to roll back underneath and install the new filter and seal that has been lubricated with some ATF. This should install with just a bit of upward force and a wiggle. Then we can lift the pan up into position. We'll get two or three of the bolts started by hand until it can hold itself up. Then we'll go around with the impact driver and snug them all down. We're not putting a lot of force on them here, just getting them gently tightened down so that they're ready to be torqued. Then we'll break out the torque wrench and start tightening them down. I'll usually go around and get them all to maybe 8 foot-pounds, and then come back around for a final pass at 12. A crisscross pattern would be ideal, but since we've already snugged them all down with the stamp steel pan, it's not going to be real picky about it, so we'll just be going around in a circle to get them to their final torque. And with that done, the pan is fully installed. 
And we can now verify that my earlier concern about the drain plug hanging kind of low is actually a valid one. The pan itself is pretty much level with the frame rails, but that drain plug now hangs down quite a bit. The catalytic converter and some of the exhaust does hang lower directly behind it, which will hopefully keep it protected. For a comparison, this is how much clearance it would have had with just a flared head bolt. It's not enormously different, but that extra quarter inch from the plug in the center isn't helping. We'll just have to see how it does, and the only way to do that is to fill the transmission back up with oil. To do that with any semblance of accuracy, we'll have to set the car back on the ground since the nose is currently pointed so far up. And with the jack stands out of the way, we'll lower it back onto the wooden ramps. The transmission dipstick gets removed from the tube. With the funnel in place, we'll fill it back up with some Dexron 6 equivalent synthetic oil. Even if the remainder of the oil in the torque converter isn't synthetic, this won't cause any issues and the higher heat resistance is a big benefit. A basic transmission fluid change like this will usually be around 5 quarts, but we'll put back in 4.5 and, and check it later while it's running. To refill this accurately, we need the engine idling in park and everything at operating temperature. This time we did the final check and top off of fluid off camera. Initially, the pan was sealed up very well. And checking on it 3 days later, it still hadn't leaked. But unfortunately, on its first significant drive, about a week after the fluid change, it started to drip. I tried tightening the plug a little bit farther, which just caused the o-ring to hop out of place, and then it was leaking even more. I ended up just slathering the plug with JB Weld, which didn't totally stop the leak, but it's at least slowed it down. What this plug really needs is some kind of a thread sealer, but to do that the transmission has to be drained. I decided that if I'm going to drain the fluid, it's because I'm going to remove the pan and switch out that aftermarket drain plug for a welded in nut and a bolt like I've used in the past. Partially for the ground clearance, partially because I don't want to have to screw around with sealers every time the plug goes back in, and partially just because that plug is small and feels quite cheap. The other reason I made a JB Weld Volcano was because I was worried about it loosening. I barely had tightened it and it felt like it wanted to strip. I'm pretty sure in the future, going forward, I will just be using the weld-in nut and bolt technique. With a flange nut on the inside, a flange bolt on the outside, and a fiber gasket between them, I don't think any leakage would be likely. For now, we're just going to leave it since it's a slow leak, and it's not even the only puddle that the car is leaving on the ground. The rear axle is also leaking gear oil. At first I thought it was the differential cover gasket, but it doesn't appear that that's the case. To get a better look, we'll once again jack up the car, this time from the rear, and set it down on jack stands. Now that we can see what's going on, it looks like the oil is actually being blown back towards the rear of the differential, but originating at the front seal. It's not leaking a lot, it's usually just a couple drips on the ground, but eventually this could cause an issue. A differential pinion seal is cheap and not that hard to change, so I figured it would be worth taking care of right now. The first thing we'll have to do is unbolt the drive shaft and get it out of the way. So we'll use the impact gun and an 11mm swivel socket to undo the four strap bolts. Between the torque arm and the exhaust, access is pretty limited, so having these tools on hand makes this much less annoying. We'll leave one of the straps attached with two of the bolts just finger tight so that we can pry the drive shaft out without it landing on my face. And once that's been freed, we'll push it forward enough to get the U-joint caps out of the yoke. To reduce the number of concurrent leaks, we decided to leave the drive shaft in the transmission and just use the bungee cord to secure it to the torque arm. At this point, it's a good idea to re-engage the parking brake to help keep everything in place. Then we'll try to clean up the yoke at least a little bit so that we can hopefully see the marks we're about to make. We'll use a hammer and a small chisel to mark a line on the yoke the pinion nut, and the pinion shaft itself. This is so we can install the yoke into the same position on the shaft, and then we can tighten the nut back down and hopefully retain the factory's preload setup. To start things off, we'll use the impact gun to break it loose. Then we'll switch to a ratchet and loosen it the rest of the way while counting the turns. Since we had marked the position, this isn't strictly necessary, but I figured it'd be worth having that extra piece of information. It took around 9.5 rotations to separate the pinion nut. And with that off, we can gently pry forward the differential yoke. 
Of course, the drain pan is underneath and ready to catch any fluid that comes out. It'll also catch the washer that I forgot to remove. Now we can just grab the yoke and fully separate it from the axle. So there's the tattered old seal, but how are we going to get it out of there? We started off using this limited access seal puller, which did get things moving, but it also punched a hole in the steel cladding of the seal. So we switched over to a chisel and used it to finish persuading the seal to come out of its home. Then we can fully remove the seal and clean things up a bit. Our new seal is a Timpkin, which cost around $8. The only concern is that the yoke is a little bit worn. There's a pretty clear line around it from where the old seal had been riding. We used some red scotch brite to polish it up before reinstalling, but there's definitely a groove there. We're just going to hope it doesn't cause any issues. We'll also definitely have to clean up the splines a bit. Once that's taken care of, we're back underneath the car and ready to install the new seal. We've applied some oil to the lips of the seal as well as the outer diameter to make installing it easier. As usual, we'll break out a piece from our ball joint press kit. We'll hammer around the outer edge in a circle, making sure the seal is going on straight. Once it was about halfway installed, we held this piece over the end of it and hammered right at the center. This helped us get it fully installed, flush with the edge of the housing since there wasn't a whole lot of room to work with. Before reinstalling the yoke, we'll apply some RTV along its splines. This is an important step that can help prevent gear oil from seeping out between the splines over time. After letting that sit for a minute or two, we'll line the marks back up and slide the yoke back onto the pinion. Then we can reinstall the washer and the pinion nut. Counting the number of turns, we'll thread it back on as far as we can before switching back to the wrench. We'll give it about 9 turns, and once it's getting tight and the marks are almost touching, we know we're almost there. Then we'll turn it that last little bit to make the marks line up as well as possible so that we know we're close to the original preload setting. And with that, we're almost ready to hit the road, but reinstalling the drive shaft would make things a little bit easier. Once it's back into place on the yoke, we'll reinstall the straps and the four bolts. And we'll go around and torque those down to 11 foot-pounds. At this point, the parking brake has been disengaged so that we can rotate everything, and we'll use a pry bar to hold the drive shaft in place while tightening. Pretty soon, that's all done and looking good. But of course, since it had been leaking and we drained some out on top of that, we'll have to top off the fluid. We'll use a 3 8 inch ratchet to remove the fill plug, and one of these large syringes to help fill the diff back up with 80W90 gear oil. It didn't take much oil, maybe about half a quart, until it was filled to the port again. Then we can reinstall the plug and torque it down to 20 foot-pounds. And that's it! We're all finished and ready to set the car back onto the ground. And once it's been lowered down, it is once again ready for the road. It was looking good for a while there, but somewhat unfortunately it does seem to be leaking again. After some driving and giving it a few months, there are a few fresh drips coming from that front seal. It seems most likely that this is due to the wear in the yoke, but there are a few other possibilities that are worth looking into. The pinion didn't feel loose, but it's possible that the bearing is showing its mileage and is letting it move around too much. Another possibility is that the vent port for the differential is clogged and pressure is able to build up inside of it. Next time the car is off the ground, this is something worth checking. But since it's a slow leak, seemingly even slower than before, for the time being we're just going to leave it. Which means, in this video I managed to create a transmission leak that I'm not going to fix, and failed to fix the differential pinion leak after putting all that effort into it. Because sometimes you win, and you're able to fix a leak or repair a broken part, and sometimes the day just goes like this. Even though the car is far from perfect, and it's fighting back a bit against our efforts to improve it, that does not mean we're going to stop. These particular problems are pretty minor and will stay on the back burner for now, but we will get back to them. Though mostly for the sake of the garage floor and driveway.